Dragon's Lair, the fantasy adventure where you become a valiant knight on a quest to rescue the fair princess from the clutches of an evil dragon. Yeah. Even with all these switches and knob thingies in my AV studio, I cannot make myself sound like Michael Rye, but hey, get this. Dragon's Lair. Go. Before I get started, I need to tell you, even though I'll be covering the extreme basics of today's topic, there's another YouTuber who gives an exceptionally well done and detailed explanation of its history. And though I hope you don't run away to watch it instead, it's well worth watching when you finish here. Link in the description below. I am Noriko, and today we are talking about Dragon's Lair. Before 1983, arcade games were pretty basic. 1971 gave us the first commercially successful arcade game, Pong. In 1974, scrolling sprite graphics were brought into the mix with Taito's Speed Race. Then in 1975, Taito gave us another improvement when it brought out Gunfight, the first arcade to use a microprocessor. This, of course, improved graphics with smoother animation. 1977 was the first vector graphics arcade game, Cinematronics Space Wars. 1978 had Space Invaders, which is credited with starting the golden age of video gaming. 1979 had Namco's Galaxian in RGB color. 1979 also gave us the Asteroids craze, and 1980 brought us perhaps the most iconic arcade game of all time, the pioneer of cutscenes and power-ups, the game meant to be woman-friendly because Iwatani Toro felt girls liked eating, Pac-Man. And in 1981, game concepts grew more complicated with Scramble, Galaga, Frogger, Donkey Kong, and Defender. But in order to understand the overall impact of 1983, one has to realize that the technology used in it was not actually an arcade game as defined at the time. It was much more than just a series of instructions, a series of if-then-elses, if you will. It was a movie. Now, Laserdisc technology had existed on the open market for six years in 1983. Which begs the question, what is a Laserdisc? And in the most simple terms, a Laserdisc is the granddaddy of all optical media formats, like Blu-ray, DVD, CD, and so on. And it used a laser to read audio-video information and play it out to the output device. Except, in its case, it was an analog signal, not a digital one. The quality was far above that of all other media of the day, the VHS, the Betamax, but unfortunately, the lack of ability to record off television hurt its marketability. One of its major strengths was the non-linear way it could access data. Not only did it not need to be rewound, it could literally access any part of the disk at a moment's notice. Now, I personally remember it being used in a science class I had back in 1981. The teacher had this rolling cart with a television and a laser disc player on it, and they were explaining all of this earth science stuff you know, like volcanoes and rocks and erosion type things. And they would punch numbers into the remote and the laser disc player would seek to and display the relevant image on the television screen. Sometimes the instructor would then skip forward, skip back, or even scrub through sections in order to play what was needed. And this feature is the kingpin on which today's entire game was built. Well, this and the skills of master animator, former Disney animator and founder of his own studio, Don Bluth. And you might know him from The Secret of Nim, An American Tale, The Land Before Time, Anastasia, and so on. In conjunction with writer Rick Dyer and a myriad of other people I'm not crediting. Sorry, everyone. Using nothing but cutscenes, the team crafted an on rails platform game experience like none other. For a paltry few quarters. <laughs> uh, no, no, seriously, who writes this stuff? Oh, me, right. Yeah. Past me leaving future me to deal with things on the fly here. So, yeah, more like a bank-breaking number of quarters. And for bank-breaking number of quarters, a player would watch the events unfold before them on the screen. They would interact with a game by way of a four-way joystick and one of a pair of buttons labeled Sword. Most of the time, the game would cue the player with the appropriate command with a flashing area on the screen. But many soon learned the programmers were sometimes devious, and this was not always reliable. Also, due to the slight delay in game responsiveness, an audible response was given. This was either a boop for a command accepted or a bzzz for a command rejected. The machine would then process the input and direct the Laserdisc player to either continue running or, with only a moment of dark screen, seek to the proper location and play the result. Now, I also have to say there were a lot of bad ends in this game. Some of them 
quite amusing. Now, if it sounds to you like I just described the first true FMV game, depending on your definition, you're most likely right. I say most likely because I cannot be sure if Astron Belt should be defined as a true FMV game. Dragon's Lair itself is, barring reversed rooms and repeats, no more than 12 minutes long, and it often included many forced stop and insert more quarters to continue stages. Yeah, let me stop right here for a bit of unscripted ranting. This game was pure evil where quarters or 100 yen coins were concerned. You could start it for as low as two coins. Two, that is if you were lucky. You know, at some kind of bargain shop arcade center. But more often than not, it took not two, but three or even four coins to start the game with three lives. Mess that up and suddenly you had to put in two coins for a continue. Not that the other people waiting in line would let you do that. But, and this is a big but, this game had three additional checkpoints built into it where you could still have all your lives remaining, all of them, and it would just pop up. The whatever section has fallen to your skill to attempt the next whatever section, insert two coins. Coins in that big old capital letters. Your remaining lives, forget it. Gone. Whoosh. Out the airlock. You want to continue the game and try to beat up the dragon Singe? That was his name, by the way. Break open your piggy bank and shove in more cash. To 13-year-old me, where every single quarter mattered, that hurt a lot more, for sure. <sighs> now, luckily for me, I'm playing this thing here, and not in an arcade game, as I already gave it a few hundred dollars when I was young. It doesn't get any more money from me for now. No. Seriously. I have this thing's dip switches set up for two coins, three lives, and no abusing the sunk cost fallacy to fleece the innocents. This playthrough uses an image taken from the original Laserdisc where the game's attract mode explains the entire object of the game for me on every eighth playthrough. Dragon's Lair, the fantasy adventure where you become a valiant knight on a quest to rescue the fair princess from the clutches of an evil dragon. Oh, wow. That LD 580 by 486 i looks like garbage. Uh, let me use those switches and knob thingies I told you about before. Okay, let's try that again. Dragon's Lair, the fantasy adventure where you become a valiant knight on a quest to rescue the fair princess from the clutches of an evil dragon. You control the actions of a daring adventurer finding his way through the castle of a dark wizard who has enchanted it with treacherous monsters and obstacles. In the mysterious caverns below the castle, your odyssey continues against the awesome forces that oppose your efforts to reach the dragon slayer. Lead on, adventurer. Your quest awaits. So, um, editing Noriko here, and I just realized I totally forgot to tell you that this is where I started playing. Not only that, I should probably tell you, I started with a running commentary while playing, but due to the random nature of the rooms and the simple fact I often had less than 0.7 seconds to react in, I was just shooting myself in the foot by distracting myself when I was talking during the play. So, I'm sorry... There's no running commentary. But as a bonus, and there is a bonus, at the end you get to see a bunch of my deaths from my failed playthroughs. Now, I'm also going to assemble this in what is known as home order. And that's the order that the animators intended the story to be told.
Oh oh. Hmm. 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 Hmm.
gets the girl. Trace from Playboy magazine's way too sensual for kids girl, but still the girl. So I guess a happy ending? What you just watched was a playthrough of a game that took the industry by storm. And as luck would have it, it was such a unique concept that it cemented itself in our collective social consciousness. Not only was it a game, it was an entire franchise. And by franchise, I mean Sequels, spin-offs, merchandise, more merchandise, even more merchandise, a cartoon series, and a bunch of remakes. I mean, if it has an electrical current running through it, there's probably a Dragon's Lair port made for it. A lot of them are side-scroller platformer games. Obviously, they have to be, but many of them, especially recently, use a gameplay like we just watched. Nintendo Switch, iDevice, Android, Go Retro with Super Artifacty Sega Mega CD. You know, the one... It shocked me. Seriously, they made a Dragon's Lair game for the Nintendo Game Boy Color.
I mean, this thing is absolutely amazing. Pixely and rudimentary, but when compared to what was done for the Super Famicom slash SNES, see also Platformer Hell, it is just way more impressive. I think there's a reason this game has stood the test of time, and you heard it in the intro. I called it an outlier. It was the right formula at the right time by the right people doing something no one else had done. No matter how hard they've tried to repeat the success it had, they failed. Instead, the original lives on in a way that almost all the rest have not, and that's why we love it. That's why we keep buying it again and again and again, generation after generation. And now, let's watch some death. Oh! <laughs> 